Number six, the use of oxygen. Who needs oxygen? So you do a venous blood gas. It'll give you the partial pressure of oxygen, which normally is 20 to 25 in a person with normal tissue perfusion and extraction. There's a very good, dense book by Von Arden on multi-step oxygen therapy. And uh, it was written in Europe. And it discusses patients who have endothelial damage and swelling from chemical exposure, which also could be mycotoxin exposure. And they offload oxygen inadequate, um, adequately, inadequately into the tissues and organs, and therefore have too much oxygen left in the vein when it goes back to the heart. So the PO2 in the artery is 100. It should be 20 in the vein and uh, that 80 is used up in the tissues. When people have a venous blood gas with a PO2 over 35, 40, 45, this is somewhat a good gauge of how sick they are because of the effect on the vasculature. Um, people above 45 are really quite ill. And um, I usually say that we should treat people about 30 or 35. Um, some people walk around with a venous PO2 of 35 and think they're totally fine, but it's not, it's actually not normal. Um, I, when I was treated, my venous blood gas um, showed an oxygen of 75. Uh, hence, I had this severe hypoxic mitochondrial damage on electron microscopy because the oxygen delivery was so poor. So on oxygen and how to give it. Um, the setup and, and uh, diagram from Dallas can be uh, attained at this phone number. There's a non-toxic Tigon tubing, a ceramic mask, a non-rebreather reservoir made of cellophane, and a wood frame, which doesn't bother the patients at all. There's also a humidification bottle so that the air is moistened and doesn't dry out the airway. It's given for two hours a day for 18 days, and a repeat VBG can be done after day nine to see if you're getting some improvement and after day 18. I've noticed that sometimes the um, results can be erroneous and be abnormal and you need to let the patient be off oxygen for a week before it settles down. Uh, the patient can exercise with oxygen on a bike while they're breathing the oxygen, which can be useful to drive the O2 more effectively into the tissues. This is a diagram of a patient using a ceramic mask with an elastic around her head and she's um, I think she's sitting in a chair, but she could be using a stationary bike with an oxygen tank and a cellophane bag reservoir. Uh, this slide I'm just going to leave in for uh, information's sake, but not go into it in detail. Uh, there's a physician named Dr. Shoemaker, and he's a researcher in the area of mold. Uh, he's not an environmental physician, but he's done some good research, uh, nonetheless, on uh, mold exposure and some of the biomarkers. So I put them down here for researchers. Um, to be able to see in case they want to pick up the ball and run with it. Um, he discovered the utility of the use of cholestyramine in biotoxin exposure illness. So um, uh, I just say that we thank him for the information that he's provided and um, I think it is not a, enough to give a patient cholestyramine to detoxify them from mold. It is essential to uh, send the patient to an environmental physician who can give appropriate advice about the whole picture. But nevertheless, um, these are some of the markers that he's found useful in mold exposure. So it's C4A, VEGF, vasointestinal peptide, melanocyte stimulating hormone, TGF beta 1, MMP9, and he's discussed extensively uh, genetic markers for people who cannot. Uh, detoxify molds very well, and these are called HLA-DR haplotypes. He also looks at leptin levels, and uh, he gets a von Willebrand's, von Willebrand's profile in some patients. Um, so we'll discuss that maybe next year. Uh, number seven is nutrient therapy. So I'm going to just go through the details of what is uh, an IV vitamin drip about. First of all, it gives you a huge impro improvement on an immediate basis. It enhances detoxification and prepares the patient for sauna, which will further help to lower the toxic load or body burden, which is one reason they are so ill. I check his G6PD level uh, before giving vitamin C in case there's any chance, especially in blacks, I believe, that there is a uh, 
possibility they will have hemolysis if given high dose vitamin C above 15 grams. Uh, once that is normal, I get my preservative free supplements from Abrams Royal Pharmacy in Dallas or other suppliers, get glass bottles of sterile water or half normal saline in 500 cc's. I remove 100 cc's of sterile water so there's room for the vitamins. And then I add 15 grams of vitamin C. I use Merit. Then I use 1 cc of B5, B6, B complex, B12, uh, which is 1,000 micrograms, trace minerals, selenium, and zinc. Uh, the magnesium is 2.5 grams or more. The bicarb is 5 cc's of 8.4 percent. Taurine is uh, 20 cc's. Carnitine is 4 cc's, and these are, I think, 500 milligrams per cc. Um, Maybe different, but you can talk to Abrams. Uh, drip over one hour or more if it's the first drip, and follow by glutathione 600 milligrams the first time, then 1,000 milligrams, and then 2,000 milligrams, and stick with about 2,000 milligrams from then on. You turn the IV vitamin drip down slower if they have warmth and flushing. This is due to the magnesium load. In patients who are very chemically sensitive, they may react to the vitamins. So you may want to do just a drip with the vitamin C because the osmol load is really the vitamin C, and the drip will have an osmolarity above 300 if you use it. Um, if they tolerate maybe a half of the dose, which would be 7.5 grams, then you can move up on the vitamin C and then sequentially add the B vitamins. The B vitamins can be very excitatory and make them have insomnia or agitation. I also have been using alpha lipoic acid, which is very useful in the detoxification of mold and has been published to be use useful in Amanita phylloides mushroom poisoning. It's also useful uh, in patients who require liver transplant and has been published uh, to, to be very um, efficacious. The dose is 300 milligrams in 100 cc's of normal saline over an hour and you must have complex uh, unsugary foods before and during the drip to avoid hypoglycemia, which I have never had occur, but is a strong possibility. Oral nutrients, which um, if they can't afford IV nutrients, which are maybe $125 a drip, they can do oral nutrition alone. And this will help the liver to detoxify whatever chemicals they've been exposed to and treat various uh, symptoms that they've developed due to nutritional deficiencies, they sort of used up their supply of nutrition and you're replenishing it. So I, I do get a CoQ10 level, but I get most patients 400 to 800 milligrams a day of CoQ10 for the rest of their life. Vitamin A, 25,000, one every other day. B complex, one a day, one at noon, uh, potentially. You don't take B complex in the afternoon because it'll keep you awake. B5 is 500 milligrams um, a couple times a day, which is very useful, um, this is pentothenic acid, for adrenal insufficiency. The adrenal really likes B, B5, and vitamin C. Uh, the vitamin C dose is 2,000 milligrams BID or less. Vitamin D is 2,000 to, some people need $15,000 uh, 15, units a day of vitamin D because they have celiac disease and are losing their fat soluble vitamins. So we like to titrate this to a level of 60 to 100 of 25 hydroxy vitamin D when you get a serum test a couple months later. Um, normal is anything above 30 on a routine test at Quest Labs, but it's found that these patients do better and have um, uh, more improvement, especially in, in cases with multiple sclerosis if the vitamin D level is kept higher. Um, vitamin E is 1,000 Q day, fish oil, two tablespoons um, every other day or one tablespoon a day. Digestive enzymes with meals, probiotics while on antibiotics, and colostrum on and off if you have um, allergy or viral infection. The patient should be uh, given iodorol, especially if they've got thyroid insufficiency. Magnesium orotate, 500 milligrams. Um, three tablets a day, especially at night, is very helpful for relaxation. And I would say that magnesium and B6 are the two most um, insufficient vitamins that the patients usually have. The use of the sauna is demonstrated by this young man in a poplar sauna with ceramic walls. Um, usually 
uh, we avoid cedar saunas because cedar is a toxic wood. And uh, the more glass and poplar, the better in the sauna. It could be rocks or it could be um, infrared. And the low temperature is what we use. Heavenly Heat has been making saunas for a long time. And there are some other sauna companies as well uh, that are reliable because they do not let pesticides be used in the wood, nor do they use adhesives in the, or glues in the production of the sauna. Here are some oral supplements that are used when people are taking the sauna so that they can metabolize the chemicals that are released into the bloodstream. Uh, calcium deglucurate, milk thistle, N-acetylcysteine or glutathione, alpha-ketoglutarate, flushing niacin, which is a, a started low so they don't have too much flushing and advanced, minerals, three each time, so they don't lose the minerals in the sweat, psyllium, to help the bowels move and remove the toxins after the sauna, as well as oil. And um, 90 minutes after the sauna, the patient can take charcoal or betonite clay away from everything else that they've had. Number 10, the rotational diet. There are many books on this subject, and Randolph et al. has um, gone into great detail. We won't discuss it very much right now, but I thought it was interesting that somebody quoted um, or paraphrased Hippocrates, Hippocrates noted that there were some people that cannot readily change their diet with impunity. To many, this has been the commencement of a serious disease when they merely take twice a day the same food which they have been in the custom of taking once. The immune system, in our view, does better with foods being ingested every four days, not daily or many times a day. Hence, given the um, frequency we, th that we eat some of the things in processed foods, we have developed intolerances to these because we eat them five times a day or eight times a day. Corn syrup would be, um, you know, an example. Gluten, soy, egg, and milk. I decided to enter a slide on provocation and neutralization allergy testing. It is the mainstay of treatment in environmental medicine, and it's important to have some documentation of what it does. Um, the mechanism is not well understood. It was discovered over 50 years ago. It's widely used by ear, nose, and throat physicians and environmental doctors in the United States. It's not based on IgE reactions, and there's never, uh, I guess we're not supposed to test people who have anaphylactic reactions to substances. Um, you're not supposed to test them for that substance. It would be inappropriate. Uh, so it has much lower risk um, because the amount that we're injecting is uh, minuscule. It's progressively more dilute antigens. They are injected intradermally on the arm in small 7 millimeter wheels every 10 minutes. A positive wheel is one that grows to 9 millimeters and is often associated with symptoms the patient gets with real exposure to that food, pollen, mold, chemical, or prosthetic material or another incitant like the air from their contaminated office. And any substance can be neutralized if an antigen is made from it. In order to take office air and make an antigen, you would bubble it through water and then use the water to make the antigen. So people can be, uh, I wouldn't say desensitized, but made to tolerate uh, uh, the office if the office isn't really that toxic but just has an odor or a mild um, chemical smell that really isn't damaging the patient, but the patient has symptoms when they're there. The first dilution with a negative wheel as you keep giving uh, injections that makes the patient feel asymptomatic is called the neutralizing dose. So therefore, you write down the neutralizing dose and concentration of uh, mold one and of food number two, and then they do egg and wheat, and they do all the pollens from their region of the country, and then they do dog, cat, and horse, and they do cotton and wool. Then they can do the heavy metals, or they can do chemicals like perfume and cigarette smoke. And the patient goes home with a neutralizing dose for each of these items that they've had tested. They're combined into five or 10 vials, and they do a 1 cc or maybe 0.1 cc injection once every four days um, for many years. Reactions to all environmental exposures are lessened or disappear this way. 
Um, I'm going to just comment briefly on the genetics of genetics of detoxification. Um, there's more proof why the condition occurs in some people but not in others when you have a sick building. And this is sometimes related to their previous toxic exposures in utero and growing up and somebody who's had a higher toxic load because they've had more exposures in the past will go down more quickly in a sick building. But also they may have genetic problems that have made them intolerant of these exposures. And uh, we all have genetic polymorphisms or SNPs um, that relate to detoxification. The question is how many do you have and are you exposed to something that goes through that pathway? Uh, here's a study of 500 people looking at four genes um, and I'm interested in GSTM1 because I am null and do not have GSTM1 found. Um, the conclusion was that NAT2 slow acetyleters and people who are homozygous for GSTM1 and GSTT1 are more likely to develop chemical sensitivity. Um, this is an article done by Sch Sch Schneckenberg uh, in 2006. Um, it illustrates the importance of glutathione in detoxification and why we use it intravenously, why we use NAC, which is converted to glutathione orally, um, and why NAC works for Tylenol overdose in the emergency room. We use these things in traditional medicine when it serves our purpose, but we need to be using them more broadly um, in the population for more uh, subtle conditions. Um, there are other things we can correct for genetically, like um, defects in MTHFR. If a patient is homozygous for this uh, polymorphism, they'll have problems with methylation. And B6, B12, and folate would be useful to give in this patient to, one, lower homocysteine and also promote pathways for detoxification using MTHFR, which have been related uh, in the autism spectrum patients. So here's a basic recap. Where to start for your patient? When you see a patient and you're a family practice physician or any other kind of physician, these are the things you could tell the patient and let them be on their way to get ready to improve. No pesticides. No perfume. Read the book by Edelson, the first chapter. And if you have mental health symptoms um, or food allergies, I would suggest they read next uh, Randolph's book, Alternative Approach to Allergies. They can go to a website like mine and look at a flyer which explains some of these symptoms. They could switch to seventh generation or another detergent. Trader Joe's powder is often tolerable to people. And then use borax to boost cleaning. Order Mountain Valley glass bottled water and five gallon uh, glass containers with a, a dispenser at the house. Or get a whole house filter in a stainless tank, not in plastic. It's preferable to drink um, Mountain Valley water. Charcoal air filter, Oasis bedroom, mold assessment if they need it. They can measure mycotoxins in the dust of their home. And um, if they find that the smell of mold is apparent when they walk in the home, they may consider moving out if they suspect mold is the problem. And they may never be able to go back in, even after it's remediated, because their immune system is so sensitive to the uh, mold, toxins, and um, spores that are in the home even if the walls are repainted and the floors are redone. This can be devastating to families, and it's important to engage the husband early so he is supportive and on board or he will abandon them. It's too much of a pain in the neck to deal with is basically the problem. Um, the patient should avoid shopping in stores. They can stay near lakes, oceans, or mountains if they're very ill where the air is cleaner, and they should get a charcoal mask if needed. We should refer the patient to an environmental or integrative physician for glass bottled IV vitamins and oral supplements to strengthen the immune system, correct POTS, check a VBG and give oxygen, treat hormone insufficiencies, then in weeks to months start the sauna with cholestyramine to help get out toxins in general and cholestyramine is more useful in mold toxins specifically. Slow down if they become too ill and halt the sauna and then send for allergy testing to your closest colleague with preservative-free antigens somewhere after they've tolerated what you've done, but not right at the beginning. For recap, this is a diagram of the mechanisms proposed for the illnesses created by pollutant overload. The barrel is um, a diagram created by Bill Ray, and any amount that overflows the barrel causes uh, the syndrome. There are on the right endocrine and immune effects, 
uh, and this leads to uh, effects on the vasculature and blood vessel deregulation, inflammation, spasm, edema, and leakage uh, through the capillary bed. The patients can get bruising, purpura, and petechiae, clots, they can get fibrosis, and they have uh, a high incidence of vasculitis. They can also get autonomic nervous system deregulation, as I've discussed in detail. So let's recap the injustice. There has been a parade of diseases that have emerged from the shadows of denial and neglect, and their actual physiologic causes were identified uh, quite some time later. It's impressive that for 15 years they thought patients with multiple sclerosis were crazy and put them on psychiatric wards. Parkinson's disease was thought to be uh, non-physiologic, as well, well as rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, stomach ulcers were stress-induced, of course, ulcerative colitis, and lupus. These were all regarded as psychosomatic or in some similar category until their actual causative mechanisms were identified. And think about it, autism was blamed on the uh, icebox, icebox mothers by psychiatrists. So we see that not, it, is, it has been a pattern in medicine to blame the patient first instead of presuming that the patient is correct in their symptoms and it is our job to figure out why they have them and what to do. I think that especially in diseases that occur in women, men in medicine have not been listening to us perhaps until today. The education of young doctors is essential in the effort to make medicine more responsive to individual sick patients' needs, and we are not treating sheep. We are treating individuals who want to get well. We do not have to have the same treatment for the masses. The public needs to demand insurance coverage for treatment that gets to the cause, not just for decades of medication that could be avoided if the cause was found. And this is my diagram. Uh, about environmental medicine being comprehensive on the top and on the bottom, that it's individualized. And I see it as the umbrella over all the other types of medicine, which I will list. Allopathic could be considered the um, stalk that supports the whole structure. You must learn allopathic medicine in order to practice any integrative or environmental medicine. And then integrative, functional, anti-aging, holistic, naturopathic, energy medicine, and autism medicine. All are under this umbrella and whether we call it environmental medicine or call it comprehensive medicine, I think it's uh, the preventive medicine of the future. Um, I'd like to recap on the Environmental Health Center of Dallas. It was started in 1974. Bill Ray, who treated me, has treated 30,000 people over three decades. He recently received funding from the Army to treat Gulf War veterans at his center. The medical board went after him because insurance run companies wanted him out. They retracted uh, their investigation last year and he was cleared. There were no violations on his part. Um, I guess those on the cutting edge are always initially unwelcome to challenge the status quo and Galileo is a good example. More clinics and hospitals are needed where research and treatment can move the field forward. They should be constructed of non-toxic materials and prevent air pollution from entering the building to a great extent so that we can study the effects of foods and chemicals on the patient's symptoms and do research and treatment this way. And I'm counting on physicians like yourself to be the key of the future of medicine. Visit the clinic, attend meetings at the Academy of Environmental Medicine, and incorporate what you learn in any field that you choose or go into the field yourself of environmental medicine. Once learned, there is no going back. In conclusion, I thank you very much for having me speak today, and I welcome your questions and follow-up calls. It's impossible to cover the whole field uh, in a lecture or two, and there is much more data to support um, the science behind this, but that's really not today's lecture. Um, environmental medicine um, is uh, really one talk, but you can handle a specific talk on mold or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and adrenal insufficiency could all be divided up into specific lectures, obviously. I run a nonprofit called the Preventive and Environmental Health Alliance, which strives to educate and assist patients and change policy and education in medical school. There is my website, environmentalmedicineinfo.com. My email is lisa at najwan.com.
and uh, my phone number and cell are also listed. Um, I have some extra slides which I will just show and won't talk about on how to take a history and first step for patients that you can review at home. I can email you PowerPoints or they may be available at the University of Pennsylvania if you want more information. Here are a couple other slides and thank you very much. I put those slides on because I have a flyer and the flyer was not available for people watching the talk. So you can look at the slides and have the same information that was on the flyer on signs and symptoms and review of systems. Great. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.